Hello, I'm Judy Woodruff. Judith Roden has been the president of the Rockefeller Foundation for the past three years. The foundation was established in 1913 by John D. Rockefeller Sr. with a simple mission to promote the well-being of humanity. With assets of almost $4 billion, the foundation works around the globe to help the poor and the vulnerable. Before she came to the foundation, Roden was the president of the University of Pennsylvania, the first woman president of an Ivy League school. During her decade at Penn, she doubled Penn's research funding, tripled its endowment, and the university moved up from number 16 to 4 in the U.S. News and World Report college rankings. I sat down with Judith Roden at her office here in New York City, and we talked about Rockefeller, the role of foundations, and women in leadership. Judith Roden, thank you very much for talking with us. It's a pleasure. Really. This storied foundation you have taken over in the last few years, the Rockefeller Foundation, has taken the lead now with this five-year initiative uh, that has to do with climate change. Why did you choose this issue? Well, climate change among um, many, I think, is the, is the cornerstone of the impact of globalization in the 21st century. You know, if you think about the last 50 years of human history, human behavior has impacted the climate more than the remainder of human history put together. So it is the burning issue. It's the issue that not only will impact our children as we talk about the future, but climate change has already occurred. We're seeing floods and hurricanes and sea level rises. And you can't pick up the newspaper in a year and not see just massive evidence of climate change already occurring. And we think it's affecting Americans. It's affecting people around the world. And we want attention to it now, investment in renewable energy, planning, a very different view about what our infrastructure ought to look like in the United States. How much, and, and, in, and in fact, how, how much harder is your work? Because the government of the country, which is the biggest carbon emitter in the world, has said that this problem is exaggerated. Well, the IPCC that just won the Nobel Prize has thousands and thousands, the International, the International Panel. Panel on Climate Change, um, thousands and thousands of scientists who are producing volumes of data that suggest otherwise. So I think we lack the political will in Washington to do it, but I don't think that there's any um, understanding at the present time that the data aren't there. Uh, I think there is a tremendous array of options about what to do about it. We're about to let the um, renewable fuel tax credit um, lapse in the United States. We're fighting about coal burning. There's technology out there already to put the carbon emissions right back into the ground. We're not investing in it in the United States. We're building roads instead of talking about light rail and other kinds of infrastructure that's more environmentally friendly. We're about to, to reauthorize the ICT, the transportation bill, which over the last several years has been about road construction. You know, we were the envy of the world with our rail, our passenger rail um, system 50 years ago, and we've let it deteriorate. So what are we doing? All of these are really, they're climate issues, they're economic security issues, and they're equity issues. And we better confront them in an integrated way if we're really going to confront what the 21st century challenges are. Well, specifically on climate change, now that you've looked so deeply into the issue, I know you're aware that many economists from the left all the way to the right are saying what is needed is, in effect, a carbon tax where there would be appropriate rebates, but you would take that money, you would use that money uh, to do something about all these issues and, and problems you've been discussing. Something is necessary to put a price on carbon, whether it's a carbon tax or a cap and trade system, which is another thing that other groups of economists are suggesting. Secondly, a lot of the systems are going to be effective because they bring the market in. You know, the market has to play a role here, whether it's inventing new technologies for renewables or trading carbon. And we've seen U.S. 
companies actually really step up. Another of the, of the number of initiatives that you've undertaken here at Rockefeller is, is your, is, has to do with the green re revolution, so-called. You've teamed up with the Gates Foundation, working with African governments and others in the nonprofit sector to improve the productivity, the income of farmers in Africa. For, for people who don't understand that term and understand the importance of it, explain in layperson's term what it's all about. Well, it's great to start with a story. Um, newly elected Vice President Henry Wallace in the 1950s was visiting Mexico, and everywhere he turned in the rural areas, he saw hunger and abject poverty. He came back from Mexico, called the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and said, what can you do about all of this hunger? And Rockefeller had been supporting scientists, really looking, even then, at conventional breeding that might produce more robust crops, drought-resistant crops, um, crops that would work in more deteriorated soil. And so it decided to undertake what ultimately became a green revolution for which Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, brought that then to Asia. And it's about really robust crops, working with the individual farmers, making in Africa her um, more uh, able to really grow, working on soil depletion, water resource management, creating markets. All of those together are necessary to create a green revolution. There are, what, 73,000 foundations in this country, but many Americans don't really understand what they do. They, they seem opaque. Help us understand the role of foundations as we move into the 21st century. Well, the role of foundations has really changed. I think in the 20th century, foundations operated more as aid institutions. Some of them operated as charities. But I think in the 21st century, foundations are looking to take on big, thorny problems, find partners who are willing to work on those problems with them. And often, um, now the partners are in the private sector. So we have public-private partnerships for the development of vaccines against HIV or TB or malaria, public-private partnership between many of the pharmaceutical companies and many of the foundations, or um, a project that we just put together in New Orleans and for New York City uh, to build affordable housing, where we brought a group of foundations together to be the first money in, then banks were willing to be lenders as the second money in, and then the city came behind it to guarantee it. Uh, the banks weren't, didn't feel able to make some of those big loans to build affordable housing because they were worried about defaults before the subprime mortgage period. And so foundations came in as the high-risk capital, um, if first in line if there were defaults with the corporate sector behind them. So this is risk capital. It's tax-free money. And I think the best of us are really saying, if we always get it right, we're not being risky enough. We're not picking big enough problems. We're not making big enough bets. And we expect to get it wrong sometime. Um, but we've got to be in there demonstrating pilots what works before we ask others to work with us to take it to scale. At the same time, some, some people have looked at foundations, studied foundations, and said they're not accountable to anyone other than to their own boards of trustees. Is, is that a problem for foundations broadly? Uh, I think accountable is a funny word because when we use it in the private sector, it sounds like there's something simmering behind it that uh, is uh, uh, non-transparent. I think in the sense of foundation's lack of accountability, it's that there, there's no bottom line. There really often, although I think increasingly less so, um, is no measurement of impact or outcome. Foundations have for a long time uh, done well by just caring a lot and really wanting to make it work and haven't measured themselves. So now accountability, if we translate that to measuring for impact, I think all of us in the foundation world are really looking for that. Um, not only because we want to be accountable, which I actually think is the, the least important part of this, but because you want to know what works, 
you want to be able to take it to scale, bring other, quote, investors in. So you really need measure. You need a line of sight. And you also need to be able to make mid-course corrections. So